Well, on behalf of the Westland Alliance for Inclusive Community, I welcome you all to this evening's panel discussion, including all abilities, a panel discussion. I'm Carol White. I'll be introducing our, our panelists. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, Tamara Gilbert will be monitoring your questions in the chat room because the format is that each panelist will make a 12 to 15 minute presentation in sequence. And then at the end, uh, Tamara will feed them the questions that she's been accumulating in the chat room. So that will be our format tonight. Uh, this is also our first uh, event where we've used, where we are using closed captioning. I think it's a new feature that the library has available. And because we want to be inclusive, we're using it. Um, on my computer, at least at the bottom of the screen, there was a button I could click that said get transcript. And then I had to click the line that said subtitles. And that way I just get the current sentence that's being spoken at the bottom of my screen. Not necessary for people who don't have um, hearing issues, but if you have a, a hearing impairment, we hope this will be helpful for you. And certainly is a worthwhile service for us to, um, to try and use uh, consistent with our mission statement. We want to thank the Westland Library, who's been our partner for over a year now in presenting interesting programs to the public. And with that as introduction, let me read the bios of our four panelists. Our first speaker tonight is Scott Hatley. He was born with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Scott Hatley is co-founder and executive director of Insight and a graduate of the University of Portland. His commitment to positive change is evident through the creation of Insight, where he works to push forward the organization's mission, changing hearts and minds, leveraging obstacles, and unlocking potential. I think that's a beautiful mission statement, Scott. He is passionate about busting the prevailing stigmas so those with barriers can contribute to their fullest potential. Scott serves on the board of directors for Exceed Enterprises and is a member of the Rotary Club of Portland. Scott served on the board of directors uh, for the United Way of the Columbia Willamette and All Hands Raised and currently sits on the organization's partnership council. The Portland Business Journal recognized Scott as one of Portland's executives of the year in 2020. He is also recognized by several organizations for his service to the disability community, including the Muscular Dystrophy Association, the Exceptional Parent Magazine, Oregon Parent Training and Information Center, Exceed Enterprises, and Exceed Enterprises. He is a native and resident of Portland, Oregon, as well as an avid sports fan, frequently attending local sporting events. And I might add, he also has a connection to West Lynn, which is where I met him as a youth. Our second panelist is Emily Purry. Her pronouns are she, her. And Emily is the owner of Purry Consultants, which helps businesses be more inclusive and welcoming to all people. She's also the founder of RAPID, RAPID, a nonprofit supporting people with disabilities and veterans with disabilities to accept, embrace, and thrive in their lives. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in business management, and she is a certified drug and alcohol counselor. She delivers presentations and training on disability topics relevant to today's business environment. The purpose of each presentation is to educate companies and organizations about disability in a positive and productive way. Legally blind herself and the parent of a child with autism, she brings her personal and professional experiences to help more companies forward. Emily and her husband Jameson are raising three biracial children with an extended family that is inclusive of many diverse identities. Topics that Emily specializes in include accessibility, intersectionality, technology, and the world of the Americans Disability Act. Welcome, Emily. Our third panelist is Bill House. Bill's journey through life started when he was born on the East Coast in Virginia. He and his wife left Virginia when they finished college and lived off the Gulf Coast uh, 
for 15 years before moving overseas, and they spent 18 years in England and Scotland. They moved from the edge of the North Sea to the Pacific Coast in 2015, settling in West Lynn. Along this journey, their family grew to include five daughters. Bill worked as an exploration geologist for over 30 years, and now he focuses on his work as an artist and writer. He joined the Westland Alliance in 2016 and has remained an active member, and we thank you for your participation, Bill. The eldest of his five daughters was born in Louisiana and diagnosed at an early age with Rett syndrome. Her mental and physical handicaps gave Bill and his wife a ground level perspective on the good and bad of how our society responds to those whose abilities fall far from the norm. From his perspective as a parent, he understands the difficulties that those with impairments face, both functionally and socially. He is also keenly aware of the challenges that the parents of impaired children face as they struggle to provide their children with all the opportunities any parent would seek for their child. For some children, every opportunity comes only after a long struggle by them and their families. <coughs> Excuse me. And our fourth panelist is Katie Mawson. Katie grew up in Nevada. She graduated with her Bachelor of Science degree in speech pathology from the University of Nevada at Reno. While obtaining her bachelor's degree, she was in an accident that resulted in a skull fracture. In the aftermath of her accident, she developed tinnitus and was diagnosed with a unilateral hearing loss. She wears a hearing aid in her right ear. She obtained her doctorate of audiology from Idaho State University in 2018. She currently works in the Portland area as an audiologist, she's mine, where she uses her experience as a hearing aid user to help guide her patients through the process of adapting to amplification and making the best recommendations for their experience. She enjoys working with all age groups and gives back to the community with advocacy initiatives for the Oregon Academy of Audiology. So I think we have quite a cross sampling and very distinguished panel. And I would like to introduce our first panelist to you. Scott, would you like to take the mic? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this, this is actually kind of fun because it feels like it's the first kind of big presentation back again with you know, the pandemic. I just haven't been out there presenting as much and talking. So it's kind of fun to certainly kind of get back into that routine. So this is a good kind of, uh, if you will, like I said, a test. And, you know, I think we can have a really good discussion tonight. Um, and uh, so I, I thought I would share a little bit about my connection with Westland and growing up, um, a little bit about the work I'm doing now, and then a little bit about kind of some, I guess, food for thought to throw out to you guys. And I'm sure Emily and, and Bill and um, Katie will probably jump in and offer more as well um but since we're obviously a connection through westland library um so i grew it was i grew up in westland um and i think it's a great sort of um dichotomy for for me and kind of just thinking about the life i've had versus the life i could have had if i grew up in a different environment um so what i found is having grown up with muscular dystrophy, I was involved at the muscular dystrophy summer camp. And for a lot of the youth in that, it was kind of like the highlight of their life. And that was contrasted with my upbringing in Westland, where it was like, not are you going to go to college, but where? And most of my friends were going to college. My parents had gone to college. They had met at Oregon State. And so for me, it was the natural, like, you're going to go to college. And, you know, so I was thinking about that mindset. And so I felt very fortunate. I grew up where I did um, to have that culture and that kind of expectation from people. Um, and so that really drove me to go to the University of Portland and to be doing what I'm doing now. Um, something to know about me is I've always seen myself as an open book. I'm very comfortable asking whatever question um, that you want to ask. Um, I've presented to kids and gotten those questions of why do you wear glasses and how do you go to the bathroom and, you know, all those kind of questions probably adults have that they never asked but wanted to ask. Um, and so 
I'm totally comfortable with that. Although I realize that not everybody with a disability has that same perspective. Some people are, would be really offended to have questions asked um, that are really personal. Um, I view it as sort of a help educate people and help kind of um, tackle that curiosity. And when you do that, I think that helps put people at ease as well and kind of helps them understand. Like when you when a kid asks and you tell them they're they're not like, you know, making fun of you. They're more like, oh, OK, I get it. That makes sense to me. Like, oh, that's great. You know, and then they move on. They they don't really read into it so much. Um, so uh, I guess for me, I went to the University of Portland. The focus there, teaching of faith service, really kind of inspired me to want to do something more than just pursue a love of sports, um, to actually do something that would contribute to society in some way and make a difference. And so that actually led to um, the launch of Insight. Um, and we're a 501c3. It's actually the hybrid of the two spellings of Insight. Um, to spark a passion and intimate knowledge of. Um, and so our focus was really initially like, how do we get more people with disabilities succeeding? How do we um, create that expectation empowerment culture that I grew up with? Um, we feel like there's more potential that resides in the disability community than has been realized at times. Um, some of it, I believe, is partly stigma um, and partly just lack of expectation. And so we wanted to change that. So our mission and visions evolved over the years, but um, in the last year, we landed on a new vision and new mission. Um, and it's kind of all been still around the same topic and subject, but um, our vision is moving the world, expecting great contributions with people experiencing disabilities. Um, the with was important because we didn't want it to, the organization be about like making someone do something they didn't want to do or like pushing a projection onto somebody else, but we didn't want to, be the ones that would do the work. It's basically like we're helping people with disabilities and you know companies and different organizations like push more boundaries and help people succeed. So it's kind of more like a self empowerment, if you will. Um, and so then that led to our mission of um, which Carol read off: um, changing hearts and minds, leveraging obstacles, and unlocking potential. And we felt like those three areas were super important and kind of more broad scope and a way to do more and lots of different avenues, not just working with people with disabilities, but helping kind of create some culture change as well and kind of bring the topic of disability to the forefront. So one of our values is actually being a thought leader. Um, and so we're really about changing the stats. And um, I haven't seen the latest stats, but um, I'm sure that they're very close to what they've been the last many years um, where like maybe about 20% of the population of people with disabilities are employed and actually have a full-time job and and then about 75% are unemployed. And I always kind of find that employment and unemployment numbers confusing a little bit and like how they calculate that. But regardless, if you look at it, um, it's still the same outcome. People with disabilities are not fully tapped into um, and are not fully living out their passions and dreams. Um, and so we kind of view that as kind of two ways. We really believe that there could be a little bit of limiting beliefs that people with disabilities have um, that maybe hold them back. But then also there's unfair judgments and negative perceptions at times that also contribute um, to where people with disabilities are at. Um, what's interesting is that the ADA was passed in 1990. Um, and actually, Carol, would you give me a sign if I go over or if it's time to wrap up? Perfect. Um, what's interesting is, you know, it passed in 1990 and it was landmark legislation, you know, protecting human rights and uh, what they really, I think, were intending to do was really change mindsets. But what it ultimately did was more just um, change the built environment. Um, and so we've found, you know, assistive technology and accommodations have increased tenfold since that time. And even I was thinking back in my time at University of Portland, which was in the late 90s into 2001. And I was kind of a bit of a trailblazer because there weren't a lot of accessible options on campus. And so then it really changed as I kind of progressed through. Um, but what is important is the ADA was really important, but it hasn't quite fully achieved, I think, what they intended it to do when they passed it, I guess, over 32 plus years ago. Um, so 
I kind of think some of it is around the disability topic, and I think it's one of those topics that's a little bit confusing and awkward and fearful, and people don't know how to kind of tiptoe around it and ask questions. And, you know, I believe you should just be kind of straightforward, but I think people, you know, it's almost like once they become adults, they kind of kind of lose that sort of um, knowing how to, I guess, to interact. And so it kind of comes off awkward at times. And so I feel like some of it is it's almost easier not to go into that conversation. And so I feel like having groups like this are important because then we're having that discussion and bringing these to the forefront and being able to answer questions. Um, I know Emily will probably have a little bit to talk about with that. She's got a cool perspective with her daughter and kind of the six-year-old perspective. Um, so that's cool. But um, I think the other thing that always creeps in too is that disability is kind of that one minority that you could really, anyone could join in a split second. Um, and, you know, you never know. It's I've, I've heard some people use the term um, temper, temporarily able-bodied. Um, and so it's just, you know, you might be born with a disability, but you may experience disability later in life. Um, and so kind of what we try to say is, well, how um, expectant and empowering is the culture you're around if that were you? Um, because really, disability has no boundaries. It really crosses all demographic lines. And um, I think some of it, again, just goes back to that lack of expectation, empowerment, accountability that kind of can overshadow much of the disability community. So for, for me, I think um, what's important is that leveraging obstacles piece, in addition to changing hearts and minds of our mission statement, is so um, huge because it is kind of talking about a different way to look at disability. Um, and so like I define it as basically having the ability to dynamically adapt to circumstances. Um, I believe it's also having open-mindedness, courage, humility when you're doing that. But we so often view obstacles and barriers as a negative, like a more deficit mindset. And I kind of believe we should view it more as an asset and helping people even with disabilities understand what that is so like I even will talk about you know my real disability is probably not my muscular dystrophy it's the other things that kind of hold me back like being a perfectionist or procrastinating or you could ask other team members and friends and I'm sure they would give you a whole list Emily might even give you a couple as well <laughs> um, one more minute Scott okay sounds good um so I'm kind of what we're trying to do is reframe conversation, have these kind of things, but also help understand what this idea of leveraging obstacles is. And you know, we use this term also compensating assets. So for me, you know, having technology allows me to compensate, but also I kind of have this super human brain, if you will, in that I almost never forget a face and name. And so I kind of use that to my advantage when the fact that I go to meetings and can't write stuff down, I can kind of use that memory and empower. So um, I guess to sum it all up, I just believe that having this conversation and kind of reframing the conversation is really essential. Um, and I think that's where I think we'll see more progress as we have more of these conversations. And obviously I think the last few years with all kinds of different difficult conversations and things that have kind of come up, you know, around, the equity inclusion and, you know, and um, diversity, like, I think that lends itself well to our discussion here. So I guess I'll leave it at that. And you guys can ask me whatever questions you want when everybody's done. Thank you, Scott. And since it wasn't clear from the closed captioning or my reading, the name of Insight is spelt I-N-C-I-G-H-T. So if you want to look up their webpage, that's how you would type it in. Okay, Perfect. our next panelist is Emily. Okay, I'm just getting my timer started here. Okay, so hello everyone, welcome. I'm really glad to be here, so thank you for having me. My name is Emily Purry, and yes, I use she, her pronouns. And um, a little bit about myself, so I'm legally blind. I've been legally blind all my life. Um, I have macular degeneration, which typically you hear up in hear of in older adults. Um, I have juvenile macular degeneration, and so it's something I've had all my life, and it's progressed slowly and quickly all all 
all the, you know, all of them in one. Um, they don't really have a clear picture of what this looks like for ju juvenile, um, for younger folks, because it's different for everyone. And it wasn't super common when we were kids. We're kind of some of the first people they saw it in juvenile, um, in, in kids. And so that's been my life all my life. Um, I do still have sight. I also have a guide dog named Bevy. So it's like Beverly, but just Bevy. And she's an amazingly cute German Shepherd. Um, and I got her about four years ago. Yep, she's six now. So four years ago. And I really got her because of elevation changes. Um, I was speaking a lot out and about. I was, um, you know, on my own prior to COVID, you know, riding mass transit and all that. Um, and so I was getting nervous and I felt like I was going to fall downstairs or fall off curbs. And so I decided to take that leap and it's been good. She thinks she's retired because of COVID. So that's a slight problem. But other than that, it's been great. Um, and so that's my main disability. I am married. I have a family. As my intro mentioned, I have a husband and my three kiddos. Um, and they are part of the reason I am doing what I'm doing today. Um, and also, obviously, my lived experience is having a disability. Um, in the past, my just my past, you know, I've grown up a pretty normal life, a quote unquote normal life, if you will. Um, and I was a big time athlete all through college. Um, I did have to forfeit my last season of soccer uh, because I couldn't track the ball anymore. I could see it, but I couldn't get under it. I couldn't get my foot behind it like the hand eye foot eye all the eye coordination stuff was just it was too getting getting too difficult so that was really hard um but i also threw javelin in college at eastern washington so that was fun a blind person throwing a big pointy stick that's frightening um but it was fun and um after that you know i went to college i did the whole thing i you know came back i moved back to portland so i was portland born and raised and in doing all that, you know, I never in a million years thought I was going to be a disability advocate. I said, nope, I'm not going to be one of those disability disabled people that are helping other disabled people. Nope, that's not me. Um, and so I look back on that and I totally laugh about it. But I started getting into it when I was working at Multnomah County, um, actually advocating not just for myself. I'd always been more of a self-advocate, but um, I really saw the need for other employees who had disabilities needing a voice. And I was, you know, like Scott says, I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. I, I, you know, it's exhausting at times. I'll tell you that, but I, that's how I approach my courses, my classes, my, my consulting, everything. Um, and so I found that I, people could talk to me and ask me, and I could be a voice for folks who didn't feel comfortable speaking up in the workplace. And so that's where my really passion for it started is I got up and did this presentation and I was like, oh my gosh, just absolutely adrenaline rush that I hadn't felt in so long. And so I said, I need to be doing more of this. I need to be doing more of this. And so for the, about the last seven years, I've been working with companies and organizations um, through the consulting world. And at first it was just disability awareness, really looking at accessibility of physical spaces, not from the ADA code, but from the humanity. Like, okay, yes, this could meet code, but what could we do better in order to make this more accessible for somebody or easier to navigate or all those things? And ADA code is so blah that a lot of people will build to code and a lot of people won't build the code, but there's the humanity aspect of it. If you just lowered this paper towel dispenser three inches or a foot, it would be considerably easier for folks to reach it. Um, so looking at that from the humanity perspective. So that's where I started and it's evolved into much more because of my family being diverse. Um, my husband's black, my three kids are mixed. My oldest has a disability. Um, let's see, I have a close family member of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, my sister-in-law's Japanese. My nephews are both mixed. My stepbrother that's 25 years younger than me is half hispanic and i don't even know what else oh my brother has a disability he has the same vision condition so we are the modern family and in me teaching and learning about disability advocacy i saw the need for even more beyond that um, to look at diversity equity and inclusion from a high level as a white woman 
Um, I stay in my lane as far as speaking about disability from, from a high level of why we should be nice to humans that don't look like us, act like us, believe like us, move like us, et cetera. Um, we do that at Prairie Consultants. And then I have contractors that I work with that are have lived experience in all the buckets. So LGBTQIA race, uh, multi-generational workplaces, all of the above, so that we're covering that, but everybody's speaking from their lived experience. Um, so that's been really exciting. Scott mentioned my six-year-old question, uh, philosophy, I guess you can call it. Um, just like Scott was saying, a lot of people never got to build the foundations of asking those questions about disability when we were six years old. We asked about the alphabet, we asked uh, why the grass is green and the sky is blue, we asked everything else. But as soon as disability was brought up, it was shut down, it was silenced, it was shame, don't look, don't stare, how dare you. And so immediately we all became fearful of either being that person, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassing, I'm nobody wants to look at me, oh, da, da, da. or the fearful of the person with a disability or that it's wrong, that it's different. And so this stigma, just like talk, Scott talked about, this stigma started to build inside of us as children and we never got to ask those six-year-old questions. So in all of my seminars, all of my trainings, all of my everything, I always have open question and I have, well, I have a link now for a Google form that I you allow people to just anonymously ask questions because they're still so ashamed to have those questions in their brains, but they still don't want to ask them out loud. And so I give them the opportunity to anonymously. And in person, we do a box in the back of the room, et cetera. But when you give people that platform to start asking those questions and understanding disability or any um, minority group without that shame and without that piece of, oh, you're a horrible individual because you don't know this. People can start opening up and trying to learn. And so I come from that perspective. Anybody I work with comes out from that perspective. And yes, there's moments where we're human and a comment or a question can, you know, get us heated at times, but not to the point where it's not productive. And so we open up that forum in all of our classes and trainings and, and everything. Um, and so that's the six year old questions. And so that's just, you know, I thought about it one day when my, Kennedy, my little one was asking a billion questions and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of the questions. But I was like, how else is she gonna learn? And now here we are as adults and we're supposed to know how to learn or how to act inside a workplace when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, disability, whatever it is but we've never gotten to build that foundation. We've never had that opportunity. And so that's the big thing I come from, from the, the consulting side. Um, I am really passionate about working with companies and organizations because A, you can get to them fast. <laughs> you can get to a lot of people fast. So the word spreads. So if the company can, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if the company can sponsor the, the training or the, the whatever it is, more people are going to be able to come and learn versus a one-off, 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 one-off. And so companies and organizations, it's a big pool of people. But then also I had experienced so much discrimination. Um, I had an injury back in 2009, which led to the founding of my nonprofit. Um, and I couldn't stand, which is what I, I was a personal trainer and massage therapist. And I was running my own business in downtown Portland and I could no longer stand on my leg for long enough to do those careers. So I had to switch careers and I had a master's degree in business and I couldn't get a job for anything. I could, I would get through all the applications. I would get all the way up to the interview. Then they would notice something was up with my eyes because I wasn't, I don't look at people straight on because my peripheral is stronger than my central. And um, so then I would never get the job. And it, it went on and on and on. And I finally had to, I, I was at an event with Insight actually, but it was OHSU's, um, oh man, what was that called? It was the affirmative action. They did a big work event where all these employers were coming to hire people with disabilities. Night for networking, I think. What was it? Night for networking. There we go. Night for networking. Yeah. And so I was there and I was terrified and I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be there. Um, but I met a recruiter from Multnomah County and she said, okay, here's the deal. She's like, I'm going to be very real with you. She had worked with people with disabilities in the past. 
She's like, I don't think this is going to fly, but I believe in you and I need you to go prove how good you can be, which is how this works. This is how the world works right now. People of minority communities have to work 10 times harder than dominant culture in order to make it. And so I said, you bet you, I'm a hard worker. I'm going to prove all these people wrong because that's what I've done all my life. Like that's part of my MO. And so I went in there and um, the director of HR at that time said, she's never going to get hired here. And I knew that I found that out afterwards, but I worked my way up, but I had to start at the bottom as an office assistant, the very lowest position in the whole entire organization before I could move up. And, and you know, I ended up as a program specialist, but it took forever and I had a master's degree. And so I said, I need to change this. I need to change this inside organizations. And everybody I worked with at the county said, dang, you're a hard worker. You're, pardon my language, a badass. But nobody gave me that chance out the gate. Nobody could see. All they could see was Emily with the vision disability. Emily, who's legally blind. Oh, she wasn't looking at me. Is she being rude? Is she being this? And so educating people was where I was like, no, I've got to change this. I've got to make sure this is not happening to other people. And so that's where all of this evolved. So I'll do a quick two minutes, I guess, on um, RAPID, which is another organization that some of you might be interested in. Um, RAPID stands for Rehabilitation and Athletic Performance Intersecting Disability. Very long name, very good acronym. Um, and so we help people with disabilities and veterans with disabilities accept, embrace, and thrive in their lives. And it, our organization focuses on health and wellness. Um, it's and all types of wellness. It can be physical wellness, mental health. It can be financial wellness. So all aspects of wellness. But so many of these services aren't available and focused on with the disability community. And so we really want to come in there and fill those gaps. Um, and so we were founded in November of 2019. We were officially founded. And so we jumped right into the pandemic as a new organization. Um, and we've been, we've just been plugging away. So we're growing, it's really exciting. Um, and we have a lot of online events for folks right now. And we're trying to get back in person as things are safe enough to maybe do some outside stuff this summer um, as we build and grow. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. And I think the biggest thing that I'm passionate about is getting inside any organization and any company to start the conversation and start normalizing the conversation about disability. It is a normal difference. My eyes are blue, my daughter's eyes are brown. I have a disability, she doesn't. You know, these are just differences, but we are seen as this whole nother class of human beings. And we, at our house, talk about differences. She's, why is your skin pink? Why is daddy's skin brown? Why is my skin lighter brown? Why do you, I mean, like we talk about differences all the time. And so we want to make sure and keep that going and hopefully educate adult humans about the same things and really make the workplace and the work environment uh, more inclusive for folks with disabilities. So again, ask any questions. I am an open book as well. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from all you. Thank you, Emily. And I will repeat, you can put your questions in the chat room. I just said sent mine uh, directly to Tamara Gilbert, um, but I think she can read them whether they're sent to her or to everybody. And with that, I would invite uh, William or Bill House to be our third panelist tonight. Okay, well, thank you, Carol. I'm really happy to be here this evening and uh, listen to these great conversations we're having. And I'm, com and I'm coming at this whole conversation as a parent of a severely disabled child. Um, my daughter has Rett syndrome. She's never spoken a word in her life that was understandable. She's still ambulatory and she has use of her hands though, which a lot of the Rett girls don't. So she's been fortunate in some respects like that. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is a lot of the things that my wife and I learned on our journey of raising Sarah. And we have four other children also of varying ages. Uh, but a lot of our, uh, our first experience, Sarah was our oldest daughter. So this was our first experience 
with a child. So Sarah was diagnosed with Rett syndrome when she was, she was about two and a half years old. Prior to that, we recognized there was some developmental issue. We went to lots of doctors, lots of medical specialists, but the response that we got was, well, you're first time parents, you're just overly worried. You know, she's just a little slow. She's going to catch up and so forth. And we, we knew that wasn't true. We knew there was a problem. We finally did get a diagnosis. And at the time we got this diagnosis, Rett syndrome was virtually unknown. I think there had only been several thousand cases in the world diagnosed. It's, it turns out it's much more common than that, but it's only just been recognized. A lot was unknown, but what was known was that it had severe mental and physical disabilities associated with the syndrome. So by the time Sarah had turned three, my wife had read enough that she probably knew more than most of the doctors that she went to. She had lots of questions. She had issues she wanted to raise, but largely she would kind of get blown off in these conversations. Um, we, were very, we were very irritated by it at first, but it took me a while to realize that the, the doctors weren't being negligent. It was, part, they're part of a system, a larger system that was ill-suited to deal with our daughter's needs. And I think this is still an issue out there. We expect doctors to provide answers after a 15, maybe a 20 minute visit. The economics of our medical system depend on this. This is what it has built. And complex problems, complex developmental issues kind of defy an immediate diagnosis. It requires time and effort to investigate and resolve these problems. This is not part of the way our system works. We don't have a medical system geared up to do this. So the burden of that task often falls with the parents who are not medical professionals most of the time. What we learned was that the healthcare system is not constructed to deal with the needs of severely handicapped children. Um, the level of effort it requires is at odds with the way the system's built economically. And this is not an indictment of doctors or the medical profession. It's simply a recognition of the reality of the American medical industry. So this was one of the first things we learned about disabilities and dealing with them. And our second set of learnings came when Sarah entered the public school systems. So we fought hard to get her an appropriate education. And we worked with a lot of very good, dedicated teachers. I mean, we, we appreciated what they were trying to do and all that. But what we found was this huge gap between what the law prescribed or the way it was, you know, the way we interpreted the law and what the final programs looked like in the classrooms. The concept of an individual education plan for us turned out to be this two-edged sword. The idea behind it's great. An educational program designed to meet the specific needs of the individual child. But the reality is that the schools are resource limited. And understandably, they favor to tailor the IEP to whatever resources they actually have. And I understand that, but as parents, we advocated for what we believed was best for our child. So it, it was not unlike negotiations that take place daily in the business world. You have two different points of view, you're trying to come to something. And so we learned how to negotiate. But my key learning was that parents of children with special needs have to add to their repertoire, legal counsel, negotiator, contract manager. There's no one else to do that. And you as a parent are sitting with a group of 15, sometimes even 20 people from the school district trying to get a program going and there's specialists there and so forth. So you really have to learn how to manage those situations. As Sarah got older in her teenage years, we had more interaction with social services. And we became very aware of the wide discrepancies in the US between different states as to what they offer. It's huge. Um, but by that time, we understood what the reality of raising our daughter was. We had no immediate family support. We lived thousands of miles away from any of our relatives. 
She needed 24 hour care. We provided it. My wife stayed home, ensured that her and her sisters got as much attention as we could muster. Uh, and my wife basically worked to keep the family together during that time. We learned that vacations were rare to non existence. Family nights out for dinner and movies were unworkable. Even shopping, just going to the mall, could be a disaster. So we looked to social services from for some relief. We metaphorically found an empty room at that point in time with social services nameplate on the top of it. There was nothing there. We were living in Texas and services for our daughter, Sarah, were not part of the state ethos. So, you know, our, our life changed when Sarah was in her mid-teens. We moved to England. It was part of my job. And there we actually encountered an educational system, a social service system that was functional, that actually did something. And our whole family benefited from the move over there. But it was our daughter, Sarah, who benefited more than anyone else. She started getting services that helped. So the lesson for me was, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, all these things that you're asked for, it's too hard to do. It's too hard for the government to provide these services. Well, I've lived in places where it's done. So these things are possible. They are doable. Um, there's one other thing that I ran into when we were raising Sarah and she was still a teenager, which I, I'll relate it to you. We went in and tried to say, what are we going to do to provide for her as she gets older? And so we engaged with an estate planner and so forth. And I was just flabbergasted when I learned that the first step in our legal system for caring for your disabled child is to disinherit them. And I'm probably oversimplifying this a little bit, but my takeaway was this. You pay your state and federal taxes annually. In theory, these taxes provide for a broad range of government services, including social services. However, you need to leave your severely handicapped child destitute in order to force the government to fulfill its duty. There's actually a specific legal structure to accomplish this. It's called a special needs trust. But it was all a learning for me as to the barriers that you face trying to provide for a child. So I would just like to say kind of in summarizing this, I identify very strongly with the stress that families are under when they have children with special needs. All these families are composed of individuals. There's a wide range of abilities and each family member experiences that stress in different ways. In general, the medical, educational, and social services that are available are often inadequate, but even then, they're still only available for those who have the time and the means to make it another part of their full-time job to go out and work with that on a daily basis. So my perspective from all this is that as a community, we need to provide appropriate recognition of the challenges that some individuals are facing, and we need to support an equitable division of public resources so that the services, services that are needed and the infrastructure that's needed to help individuals and their families meet these challenges on a daily basis can be provided. Um, so I'm open to any questions people would have and I, I thank you again for letting me speak and just tell you a little bit about my experience and my observations on our society and the challenges that not only people with disabilities but their families face also. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate hearing that. <clears throat> A lot of food for thought. Our fourth panelist is Katie Mawson. Hello, everyone. Um, as Carol said, my name is Katie Mawson. I'm a doctor of audiology. Um, I currently work in a private practice in Portland. I have been practicing since 2018. Um, as stated in my bio, I was in undergrad going for my, uh, basically my speech pathology degree that I was planning to convert to a doctorate in audiology. And I was in a traumatic accident that resulted in a hearing loss. Um, 
before that, my, my nephew was kind of the reason that I got into audiology in the first place. He was born with a unilateral hearing loss and he wears a bone anchored hearing aid. So I got to see the patient perspective and the family perspective, uh, before I became a, a patient myself. Um, so really he is the biggest reason that I would say that I have arrived at the path that I chose in my life. Um, my, obviously I've, I was, it was 2011 when I was diagnosed. And so I don't really have a long history with my hearing loss. Um, mostly because I still have one good ear, I can cope fairly well. And most of the time people don't realize that I have a hearing loss because I can navigate certain situations fairly well. Um, but there are certain things that have become difficult, especially since the, um, the pandemic started, which I'm sure is true for most everyone. Things have been pretty tough for the last couple of years. Um, but I would say for myself, um, one of the things that I have struggled with is the lack of visualization of people's faces. I get a lot of visual cues from people, um, especially my patients who also are usually hearing impaired who also rely on facial expressions and speech reading and things like that. Um, so I've, I've kind of learned to adapt within a clinic setting um, within the last couple of years to cope with that type of thing because half of your face is covered. And at the beginning of the pandemic, um, people had multiple masks on their faces, which muffled their voice, which really made it difficult to to, to track. Um, I think if anything that I've learned in the last several years is mostly just that as human beings in general, we are very, um, we're very visual creatures. We like to have that input or um, that feedback from the people we're talking to, whether it's a vocal acknowledgement of understanding or a head nod or hand gestures, or even, you know, gently placing your hand on someone's arm and, you know, saying, pick this up, like, you know, showing them things. And um, from my perspective, I think that the struggles I was dealing with also paralleled very well with the things that my patients were experiencing when they would go out to the grocery store. Um, the things that I've heard the most in the last several uh, months have been, you know, people are, people are grateful that the barriers are coming down in the grocery store because now they have one less thing blocking the sound so that they can hear and understand better when they're communicating in those situations. Um, I think that the other kind of funny, frustrating thing that has happened is uh, hearing aid and mask usage. I, I hear every day that it's really hard to wear a mask with over the ear hearing aids, which is exactly what I wear. And for me, I, I really didn't give it a second thought because it's something that I had to adapt to. Um, I wear glasses. I also wear a mask. I wear a hearing aid. That's, that's kind of the, the go about every day. I also have incredibly wild hair that likes to get tangled in things very frequently. So I didn't really think about how teaching a patient to wear hearing aids with a mask is really important um, because it came naturally for me. It was just something that I expected that other people would have figured out. Um, and I've had several patients that have come in and said that they, they have avoided wearing their hearing aids and they have avoided interacting with other people, not just because of the, the presence of COVID, but because they can't wear their hearing aids with a mask and stay safe. So they have determined that it's better for them to just wear the mask and stay safe in that regard, but not wear their hearing aids because it's too much of a hassle. It's, it's too much behind their ears. So um, my coworker and myself kind of got together and we partnered with a hearing aid manufacturer to create these printouts, which, um, you know, they, it hangs in my office now. It's how to wear a mask with hearing aids. And basically it shows you different methods like 
taking your mask off from the top down versus from the sides or getting a mask that ties around your head or, you know, wearing a face shield with a mask that clips around your neck, things like that. And I think that just acknowledging that someone had that difficulty has opened up so many different conversations um, with patients, even patients, family members that come in that are like, my husband wears hearing aids. I'm, this is fantastic. I didn't realize that this was a way that I could support his communication was making sure that his mask was comfortable. So he could actually wear his hearing aids to our daughter's baptism or whatever it was. Um, the other thing that has really been, I have a hard time with audio on, um, TVs and movies and the news. Um, I, Maybe it's probably just because I'm a very distractible person in general, but um, I learned in 2019 that the White House does not provide closed captioning on their official press conferences. Um, so one of the advocacy initiatives that we have taken under our wing is trying to get closed captioning for every press conference, every meeting, everything, because that's access to information. Um, also the, um, you know, the transition from being in person to switching to uh, Zoom meetings or Google Meets. Um, I think it's fantastic that we now have closed captioning that we have access to, um, even, if, even if it's not as fast as what it could be. Um, this is actually, it's come a long way, even just in the last year. Um, it used to be riddled with a lot of errors as far as words or um, phrases and things like that. So oftentimes if you rely on those captions speaking, you know, if you're speaking with someone, you can't catch certain um, experiences or tones or the way that things are coming across because if a word is um, misspelled or is in the wrong place or it's the wrong word entirely that completely changes the meaning of a sentence for someone um the other thing that i have also kind of had experience with is um teaching my friends and family how to communicate with me effectively um my parents have a habit of think, forgetting that I wear a hearing aid and they, it's just because it's not something that they have, I was out of the house when I was diagnosed. So it wasn't something that they kind of grew up, you know, raised me with. So um, they have a habit of yelling at me from the garage and expecting me to hear them in the kitchen. And that just doesn't work. So I have to remind them, please you know, come into the same room so I can actually hear what you're saying. And that causes a lot of frustration for some people, but that's also a shared experience that I have with most of the patients that I see as well. So I feel like I can use that to empathize with them and say, you know, I completely understand where you're coming from. My parents do the same thing. Um, teaching my, my partner to make sure that he enunciates because he has a very low voice and he has a tendency to mumble to himself, which is fine. But at the same time, I need to know the difference between you talking under your breath by yourself or if you're actually asking me a question. And sometimes I think that he forgets that that's, you know, he has to make that distinction for me. Um, also driving in a car, my hearing aid is in the right ear. Um, so if I'm trying to have a conversation with someone in the passenger seat while I'm driving, that's a really difficult situation to navigate with. Um, in 2017, uh, my dad is a highway patrolman. Um, he started, I guess it was earlier than 2017. Um, he, they, the state of Nevada, where I'm from, initiated a pa uh, passenger side stop. Um, to keep officers safe when they make roadside assistance calls. Unfortunately, because if I was being stopped, I'd have to look at the passenger side, which would then mean that my poor ear was facing the side that the officer was on, which means that I'm going to miss a lot of information, which could lead to a difficult situation. Um, obviously, as a white woman, um, I'm not really in that big of a 
issue. I, I don't, I will acknowledge my privilege in that situation. Um, but I feel like there are people out there who could have that same issue as me. So I worked with my dad who presented it to his chief and I said, Hey, this is, this is a big problem. I don't think that this is going to work. Um, you need to come up with a way for deaf and hard of hearing people to let you know that they are going to have difficulty initiating, you know, in a traffic stop, initiating communication. Um, and you need to make sure that interpreters are on standby if the person uses sign language um, to communicate, because that's going to be something that comes up. Um, and they, the state of Nevada issued a um, card that now says you can clip it to your visor and it says that you are deaf or hard of hearing and your preferred communication method, whether that's sign language or a different type of communication with written or verbal. Um, and officers now know to look for those things. Um, so I think in a way, um, using my experience as someone who's hard of hearing um, has helped become a force for positive change, but also making sure that I use that to educate people as well, which is sometimes a little more difficult if they're unreceptive, but I think that's also the capacity of being a doctor. Um, and I completely agree with what William said. I think that our medical system is very poorly equipped to handle patients with disabilities, honestly. Um, so that's all I have. I'm super grateful to have been invited to this. I think that this is a fantastic forum and I've already, I've furiously taken notes <laughs> about other, you know, what the other panelists have said. And um, I, I wish you all the best. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, before we get to the questions, I wanted to point out that next month, uh, on May 14th, we will be sponsoring another program with the library, but instead of it being on Thursday evening, it will be on Saturday from 9.30 to noon. The presenter will be Tamara Gilbert, and the title is Unraveling Othering. And I think we've had some examples tonight of the tendency of people to other uh, people with impairments, and Tamara has graciously taken a a 12-hour presentation and boiled it down to two and a half. I've been to it before, and I can highly recommend it. So you will be able to register for that either on the westlandalliance.org or on the library site. I'm not sure whether it's up yet, but I just wanted to let people know that our next program will be on uh, Saturday, May 14th. Okay, um, Tamara, do we have questions for the uh, pre presenters? Yes, we do, we do have questions. Um, and I guess this can be answered by, by you know, several people. Um, what kind of technologies have come out recently that you're aware of that have helped people with um, impairments improve their lives? I can take a stab at it. Um, well, especially for the visual impairment community, there's a lot of apps that are really helpful and apps that are, um, you know, if you're looking for something to help out with, um, one of them being Be My Eyes, Be My Eyes. And it allows for um, a volunteer, like any one of you who have sight to you register on your end and then somebody like myself would register on the other end who's visually impaired or blind. And it's, nation, it's, it's global. So there's a bazillion different languages offered and it's 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. And so you call like on the, using your camera and if um, friends that have used the app that have talked to me about it there, you can stay, the person will say, hey, can you tell me if my light is on or off? and the person's using their camera. And then you're like, well, I'm assuming it's off because I can't see anything. Can you try to turn it on? And they're like, yeah, okay. So is this on or off? And so it can be like, I dropped my earring on the floor. Can you help me find it? I'm lost. Can you tell me what street signs are around? Um, it can be any task that a blind person is needing help with in the moment. Um, 
so that's one of them. And then there's like seeing AI, which is another one that helps read documents, helps read menus, helps just navigate um, some of the challenges that visual impairment blind folks um, run into out in the world that's not super accessible. Um, those are some of the ones that come to mind immediately for visual impairment. But yeah, I'll let somebody else jump in. Well, I was going to say there's some simple tools, even on like the Microsoft operating platform. Um, they've got, you know, um, voice recognition software you can use. Um, they have on-screen keyboards, which I use a lot. Um, I've also used Dragon, naturally speaking. It's a great dictation program. And it's good for anybody, whether they have a disability or not, because they kind of, you know, can um, put out a lot of thoughts quickly without having to type them. Um, and then I even just love that... Um, zoom has the uh, transcript and i've used that when i've interviewed people um so then i don't have to worry about notes it's just like printed out but um all those like simple things are starting to just creep in and kind of be available for all all types of people so it's almost i guess more universal design i think is that the right term i think that's yep. it uh, one of the things that I have learned um, that hearing aid users have had access to for quite some time is uh, if you have an iPhone, you have something called Start Live Listen, which basically takes your phone and turns it into a microphone you can give to someone else to talk into, and it streams the information to your hearing aids. Um, Apple has now opened that platform up to be eligible to use with your AirPods. So if you use AirPods, you can also have access to Start Live Listen. So again, universal access. Um, that's probably been the biggest game changer as far as connectivity for um, hard of hearing people. I, I'll, I'll add on to that. And my father, who's in his mid 90s now, is going deaf in one ear. He has a lot of uh, hearing issues. And when I visited with him last time, I went out, just like you're saying, I got him a pair of earbuds. I hooked them into his computer because he likes to watch YouTube, but he couldn't hear what was going on. So the earbuds that are sitting in your ear can be used with the platform. Like you said, you can, people can hook them into their TVs. Uh, if they want to call their relatives, they could stick them in and do it. It makes a huge difference. And the technology is getting very good. It, it made a tremendous difference to him to be able to just get the normal Bluetooth earbuds and hook them up to several devices. Well, while we still have you, Bill, um, another question came in. You spoke about different systems of care, both in the States and also in, in the UK. Um, can you give us more specifics about what you experienced in Great Britain? Yeah, in Great, well, in Great Britain now is, you know, composed of England, Scotland, and, uh, and Wales and Northern Ireland. So each of them are kind of semi-autonomous, but in general, social services, what we found is they were very accommodating. When we moved over there, we immediately got in touch with them. People came out to the house. They talked to us. They looked at our daughter's situation. Um, the schools, same thing. They were very accommodating. And they did not have some, some things in the schools that we had here. They were much more about particularly getting kids with severe disabilities into special schools, which I know is frowned on here. But it actually gave Sarah a better situation than she had in Texas. Uh, and then social services there carry, carry on through to group homes and these sorts of things much more easily than in the States. Um, I, I guess I've had some, well, one of my cousins who lives in Chicago has a son with some disabilities who requires a fair amount of help. And as she put it to me one time, the only way she could get her son into a group home was for an emergency to happen. Mm -hmm. And once that happened and she, she and her husband were sort of temporarily incapacitated, there was no one to care. 
only when it was at a crisis level could they actually get him into a home. In the UK, they approached you. They said, yes, we, here's, here's a lot of options. We think that these would be great for her. So it's just overall a much more accommodating system for people with severe disabilities like my daughter. There, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, that question all the way. It seems what you're saying is that social services is coming to you and making some proposals rather than you having to go on knocking on this door and that door and, and piecing things together as your own case so, manager. Social services is much better funded and the people working in social services come to help you solve problems and they come to you looking for solutions. Whereas my whole experience in the States was we went to social services asking for help, kind of begging for help. And it was very, very difficult to make any inroads. No one was really interested in problem solving. It was really more about, well, we, we don't have the resources right now. We will put you on a list. You know, it, it was 50 years ago um, this year that the um, uh, Center for Independent Living was started in Berkeley, California. This is one of the first independent living centers. And as you mentioned, each state in the United States has different configurations. California has, I believe, 11 independent living centers. And I had the honor of working for one of them a number of years ago. So I'm wondering why Oregon hasn't been able to create a network. I mean, the, the place where I worked offered services such as occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, legal counseling, um, you know, anything of, uh, you know, social classes, you know, where people can socialize, anything that's going to help a person live in the community and get the resources that he or she is needing. So I'm wondering why is it that Oregon doesn't have this statewide? What is it that we're doing here that isn't happening? I, I Tamara, I don't think it's just Oregon. Uh, every state we've ever lived in has had issues. Now we haven't lived in all of them. And I know people who live in lots of other states who have all sorts of issues getting what I would consider basic services. So I don't think it's just Oregon. That's my, yeah, that's my observation, not, not from studying every state, but from talking with people who live in some of the other states and my own lived experience. I, I, Tamara, I don't know if you have, I have a question on my chat here yes. asking about disability assistance. I don't know if you, I saw that's that in your yeah. list. Okay, yeah. that's fine. I'll let you get to it when you do. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just, I was looking at the question. It was, it was really asking about um, getting benefits and getting assistance for um, a middle-aged person with some disabilities. And how do you get into the system? And I, I'll, I haven't here. I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I, and I'll be honest, most of my experience in the States is about 20 years old. The most of my more recent experience was all in the UK. Uh, I guess I, I would say that in dealing with the state governments and the federal government, my observation has always been that the squeaky wheel will get the grease. And it is unfortunately in trying to get some of these services and get disability payments, I've had people tell me they just have to keep going back and back and back and until something gives. They just have to keep pushing until something gives. So it's, it's not a very satisfactory answer. I know, and I, I don't think I have too much, in, but other people here might be, have much better answers than I do on that. I think the only thing I could think of is um, there's a group called Disability Rights Oregon 
and they might have some thoughts or guidance as well. Um, they're kind of entwined with the legal side of things. Um, they're the ones that I think help bring that lawsuit against the state of Oregon around the shelter workshop. Um, so I don't know if they'd be helpful or not, but that's about the only thing I can think of that might direct you in the right way. Carol, that's all the questions that have come in through the chat. You might want to open up the floor if anyone has more. Um, yes, be glad to do that. We, um, we can always end early, but uh, we've had some excellent presentations tonight, and hopefully there are some more questions for our panelists. You can do it by asking or a show of hand. I actually have a question for Emily. Uh, Emily, you mentioned working with companies and um, kind of trying to educate companies in disability rights. Um, how big does the company have to be in order to utilize your services? It doesn't have to be big at all. I've, I've definitely worked with big and small. Governments love me, which is great. They, they always are looking to enhance their knowledge of their employees. So those are the big ones. You know, I work with the state of Oregon, Oregon Metro, Multnomah County, all of those, but also small companies that are looking to make what, if it's just education, if it's looking at accessibility, if it's, you know, a lot of the smaller companies are usually project-based. So if they're wanting a digital assessment um, to see if their digital platforms are accessible or their websites or their their apps. Um, it's usually more project-based versus um, full-blown pro programs as far as, you know, annual surveys and ongoing training and, and, and like the bigger organizations do, but we're, I, we're definitely flexible, so. All right, well, if I don't hear anyone else, um, remember that this has been recorded and we will have it up on our website. Uh, I don't know how long it'll take Cheryl and Bill to work together to get it up on our website. Uh, it'll probably be on, I presume it'll be on YouTube with a link to there, but um, please share it with, I was, as I was listening to this tonight, I was already thinking of someone that uh, isn't here tonight that I know would have benefited. And now I can share it with him. So uh, please remember that it's being recorded and spread the word that uh, there were some interesting stories here tonight. Anything else before I adjourn? I would just like to say I'm very, very impressed by everyone. And I'm sorry. I hope my coming and going wasn't Destructive, destructive. I there was a mini emergency on my floor, so <laughs> I was called in to to help with it. But um, I, I'm just so impressed, and it was such a wide ranging discussion of of disabilities. And I have to say, I'm I'm really I'm humbled by all of you and your tenacity um, to overcome the disabilities or work with them. And I, I guess if I had a question, it would be. You all, including you, Bill, as a parent, um, you, you battled your way through this. So you did have a lot of persistence and a lot of resilience. Um, not every disabled person is as lucky as four of you, obviously, we know that. So I, I guess, are there any tips um, you know, I don't, my children are all grown. Thankfully, they don't have any disabilities, but um, I, I always wonder what about the person who finds it difficult to work their way through this and, and what tips you might give, if any, except just keep trying. To them or to us as their <laughs> neighbors? What's that? To them or to us as their neighbors? Yeah, right, either, exactly. Right. I think the biggest thing is finding community, um, whatever that community looks like for that person. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing about, you know, COVID and eh, that magnified it, but isolation, you know, uh, folks with disabilities tend to not have as many friends because 
it's not as easy to go out and about. It's not as easy to drive or to get to places or they have a, you know, care assistance or minimal now um, more than normal. Uh, And so it's harder to do those things. And so the isolation is depressing as it would be for any human. Um, And so getting out and finding that community and as a friend, a neighbor, a family member, finding that community, like Bill talked about, I, I would imagine just friends of, other parents with disabilities of kids that have disabilities. It's like, you have to find, and then they'll connect you to those resources and they'll, you'll come together and you'll have fun and you'll have a community that looks like you and moves like you. And so whatever that looks like, but finding that community. And when you're in those trenches, it's not the first thing on your mind, (laughs) you know, you're just trying to survive and meet your basic needs. But finding those communities, I think can really boost you know, the mental, mental fatigue, the, you know, mental health challenges that come along with disability often. And mm-hmm. just for that social aspect of life that we all, that we all need and we, we crave belonging. And sometimes we don't feel like we belong because there's nobody around us that looks like us. Um, and so finding that community, whether you're a parent, a friend, a, a person with disabilities. I would add on to what Emily's saying also and just say showing up. Um, That's always a big part. Like I just constantly continue to show up and, you know, you find your way when you show up. Um, I think, was it the same, like success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. So kind of like just continuing to stick with it. Um, You know, even when maybe it seems hard or it's not quite there, you just kind of keep going through the motions. And then at a certain point, good things happen and positive things happen and you just keep moving so i think that's also just as important as community as well yeah, I'll, I'll echo what emily said i uh when we were living in houston and we were there for about nine years or so with sarah we met up with a group a Rett syndrome group so mm-hmm. everyone there had a daughter with Rett syndrome and we would meet on a quarterly basis, but it was a great opportunity to share information because we would talk with them. We would find out where, where are medical professionals who actually understand something about the syndrome? Where are you gonna find them? And people could give you tips. Uh, when it came down to looking at disability benefits and things like that, we were able to meet up with parents who had a daughter who was at that stage where they were applying. So these are the kinds of tips that helped us and gave us some direction that, to be honest, we couldn't have gotten anywhere else because there was no, it was very difficult to find it on your own. This was before internet. So you couldn't Google anything. Trying to actually just get basic information was a huge, huge problem at that point. So these groups helped a lot. Thank you. I think one thing um, on the opposite side of the coin is once you find your community, um, find the people that can support you the best way that they know how. Um, I know that this is something that I counsel really heavily on is um, not only just the patient accepting their hearing loss and their difficulties, but also their families helping them and supporting them and understanding what it means to be hearing impaired and how they can provide support in the most um, compassionate way possible. Thank you. I, I would add to that, I now live in a, I'm in the independent living area of a senior community. And many of my neighbors are hearing impaired. And I'm becoming more and more aware of that as an issue just in the larger community I live in. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm beginning to know who is and who isn't. And just overall changing my pattern of speaking and communicating because I think a large percentage of them uh, have hearing impairments. Which brings me to another point that we've touched on some major impairments tonight, but a large part of our population may have juvenile diabetes, they could have congestive heart failure, there are 
There can be people going through radiation for cancer uh, that you don't know about. Um, so just being aware that a, a large percentage of the population probably has some health issue and being compassionate and having some expectation around that uh, is probably going to lead to healthier relationships. On that note, Carol, remembering that not every disability is visible. There's not tangible things that you can, you know, see and feel and all of those things. Um, so just, yeah, having kindness and making sure that, you know, disabilities don't discriminate based on age. An example is people who have PTSD and what uh, fireworks on the 4th of July can trigger for them. So we're becoming more aware of those things. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for participating tonight. And uh, May 14th will be our next presentation. Uh, I think Cheryl put in the chat room the, that the registration for that is already up on the uh, library site. And have a good evening. <laughs>